you may actually find these numbers quite surprising. $1.3 trillion is spent every year treating and managing diabetes. It is the most expensive disease in the world, with more than 400 million people affected. At this rate, with the numbers growing, it could really damage our medical system if we don't find a cure. Fortunately, we're finding one. We're getting very close in Edmonton, Alberta. 20 years ago, Dr. James Shapiro pioneered something called the Edmonton Protocol, a transplant technique. It worked in the short term, but now we're on the verge of actually finding a cure using stem cells. They are, of course, today's medical miracle. And the work initially started on using cells from donors, but if it could actually come from the diabetic themselves, then rejection would be unlikely, and that would be a cure, not a treatment. Dr. James Shapiro leads this groundbreaking, life-altering research. He's a liver transplant surgeon, and he is in Edmonton, Alberta, coming to Canada in 1993. What brought you here? Thank you, Pamela. Well, I came here to train in liver transplant surgery. And uh, I was very fortunate to be able to do that. And that's my sort of day job is uh, liver transplant <laughs> surgery and other complex <laughs> surgeries on the liver and pancreas. But I'd had a, a long-standing interest in islet cell transplantation, which is a, a form of cell transplant where we put back the cells in the body from patients with type 1 diabetes, where the cells have been destroyed by the immune system. And uh, I'd been working on that as a medical student 35 yeah. years ago, in fact, in, in Newcastle in, in, in England. And we I'd, can tell your accents are dead giveaways. So, yes. So, well, it's not very strong from Yorkshire, which is where I <laughs> hailed from, but, but um, yeah, it's certainly English. So, so I'd been working on that for, for, for quite a while. I'd had a long standing interest in it. And I'd researched it for a year. None of my experiments worked in England, but coming to Canada in 1993 gave me the opportunity in Edmonton to continue that work. I was really excited to come here. You know, I think we have to do something really basic here. I, I'm i more familiar than most because I have had two nieces that uh, have had diabetes their entire life. One passed away uh, recently, but this is a lifelong thing. How does diabetes happen? So there's different forms of diabetes and, and there's, there's actually many different forms, but yeah. At the end of the day, what happens is when you have diabetes, your body is no longer able to control your blood sugar. So when the blood sugar rises uh, to a level that is unacceptable, the, the, eventually the, the, the arteries fur up, the, the large arteries fur up and the small, tiny little micro arteries fur up. And that leads to all kinds of complications and havoc. So blindness kidney failure, strokes, heart disease, uh, amputations, shortened lifespan are, are just, just the tip of the iceberg for patients that, that struggle with this disease every day. And then there's the fear because of insulin. Insulin is, is, is not a very precise tool. So although it's a wonderful discovery and we're celebrating almost 100 years since... Abandoning and best, yes. Exactly. Almost 100 years. It's a you know, great life-saving discovery, but it's far from perfect. And so... <laughs> Complications happen and insulin can't control those uh, precisely enough. And too much insulin, uh, which often happens to patients taking insulin injections, leads to dangerous lows in the blood sugar. And when the blood sugar drops below a certain point, the brain can't function anymore. So patients pass out. Some patients even die in bed, dead in bed syndrome, uh, because they get too much insulin during the night. So it's a, it's a real problem and it's imprecise. So uh, the way I like to look up, look upon it is with, with insulin injections today, we give that under the skin and there's been mm -hmm. lots of improvements in, in different kinds of insulin and pumps and continuous monitoring systems, new, new technology, but it's still far from perfect. I look upon it. If you think about the thermostat in your house, measuring the temperature, well, here you mm -hmm. want to measure the, 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 the blood sugar, but it's a bit like the, 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 the furnaces downstairs in your basement, but the, but the thermostat that controls it is down in the garden shed at minus 17 Celsius <laughs> today here. So, so you, you, you never have a precise control of your blood sugar, uh, even with the best diabetes care. So the, the, that 
can happen in a child as young as two or maybe at birth or maybe it doesn't happen till later. What's the trigger? We long believed this was hereditary. Then we believed it was triggered by uh, spikes in temperature, flus, other illnesses. Is it all of the above or none of the above? It's probably all of the above. And just to get back to your question about the different types of diabetes, yeah. the main, the two main types are type 1 and type 2. And we can get much more complex. We don't need to. But type 1, essentially, the body's immune system, for some reason, by some accident, uh, starts to attack the cells inside the pancreas that make insulin, the islet cells. We- we don't know why. Well, sometimes we do. Sometimes okay. it's a um, think, think of it. Think of it. We, we know a lot about antibodies these days. You know, the general mm. public does, of course, with, with COVID. Yeah. But, but you think of a trigger. So you you get an infection, a virus infection. Your body makes an antibody that fights the virus. Now, just sometimes by accident, I suppose that same antibody will have this, an identical target on on the beta cell. So it will end up destroying that cell inside the pancreas by accident. And there's not a lot we can do wow. about it. We don't know why it happens in some people and not in others. It clearly is genetic because there's a very strong genetic preponderance to type one, but not always. And and there can be different triggers in different people. So uh, answering it for any one individual, I think sometimes can be, but it can be hard. But I think we know in general, there's a, a genetic propensity. So your genes make you susceptible. And then there's some env- environmental trigger at some point that will mm-hmm. tip you over the edge. That's a type one. Right. Uh, Type 2 diabetes is a little bit different so that the the body basically initially becomes resistant to the insulin that the, 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 the pancreas is making. And that can happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's the receptors on the surface of the cell. Sometimes it's something wrong with the pancreas itself. And sometimes it's just the body obesity makes can make you resistant. So what tends to happen over the course of time when that happens, the pancreas tries to pump out more and more insulin and eventually in simple terms, it it burns out and and no longer has that ability. One of the things I read that I found fascinating because it'll it'll get us to this islet transplant research you were doing, but you say by day 27 in the human embryo as it is developing, the first islet cells are forming. So it's 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 like the pancreas is the first thing that is really developed in a human embryo. Well, not really. There's, okay. there's, it, 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 there's an awful lot that goes on in the first 27 days of, of the <laughs> development of an embryo. I mean, it's it's uh, not only is it, it, it not only is it fascinating, it's it's awe inspiring. You yes. can start with this ball of cells. They call it the blastocyst. You know, maybe it's 50, 100 cells, and they keep multiplying and dividing and dividing and dividing, and eventually they form a, a, a path. So there's you know, while, while parts of the pancreas are forming, other parts are forming the stomach, and there's a lot of interaction between the between those uh, cells. There's a lot of signaling that goes on that, that sort of directs them, and it's all controlled, of course, by by the genes inside the cell. So these islet cells are developing. So they're there. They're supposed to be there. They're the ones that are supposed to control this whole system. Once you're uh, born and begin to grow up, what what? How did you come upon that, that finding those islet cells and trying to transplant those into a diabetic would somehow work? Where'd that come from? Well, I won't take credit for it, but I'll just say <laughs> this. So, so, so it, re- it really began, well, if you really, if you really go back in time, it goes back to the 1890s, believe it or not, when, the, when there were um, surgeons in England uh, Patients would come in, children would come in with, with uh, profound comas from, from diabetes. There was no treatment. It was you know, mm-hmm. 27 years before the discovery of insulin by Banting and Best. So there was no treatment. And uh, so they had the idea that they could maybe transplant the, the, the pieces of pancreas. So they, in, in, the, in Bristol, where I trained to be a surgeon, uh, one, one of the surgeons there in 1893 took a, took a, a sheep from, from the Bristol Downs, took the pancreas out and transplanted pieces of that sheep's pancreas under the skin of this 13-year-old boy. Well, of course, that was a 
a, a, a transplant that wouldn't, was destined never to work. It's a, a, right. a, a Xeno transplant, sheep to human body massively rejects that very quickly. But of course it was years before there was any understanding of the immune system. And then in 1916, there was a surgeon in Newcastle also where I trained in, as a True. medical student um, called Frederick Charles Pybus. And he had the idea that he could take an organ donor. Uh, so there was somebody that was killed in a road traffic accident, an RTA, they called them in those days. Mm-hmm. And they, they would scoop out the the pancreas and put pieces again under under the skin. So this was sort of a desperate idea to 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 treat diabetes with with the cells from the pancreas in a very crude way, and it, it clearly didn't work. And then uh, back in the 1970s, there was a pathologist doctor in a scientist in in St. Louis, Missouri, who called Paul Lacey. And he had, he extracted this idea further and he took mice and he was able to develop a process that would, that would allow the islet cells that make the insulin to be extracted from the pancreas. He'd handpick them under the microscope and then he'd transplant them into diabetic mice and what he found, uh, and rats, and what he found that he was able to reverse the chemical diabetes in mice and rats with this process of islet cell transplant. So that's, that's how that's how the story began. There's a long history. Then fast is, forward yeah, to you. Yeah. Well, fast forward a little bit more. So, so then uh, people had the idea. Well, if it works in mice, it surely it'll work in people. So then yeah. they began transplanting islet cells in in patients in in the early 1980s. And there were, by the time I came sort of on the scene in Alberta, there had been almost 300 islet cell transplant attempts in patients. Very few of those transplants worked, and and when they did work, they worked for very short periods of time. Right. So there was there was actually a surgical team here in Edmonton: Ray Rajat, Norman <laughs> Kneetman, Garth Warnock, and and Eddie Ryan, who who'd carried out islet cell transplants in in about four or five patients, uh, with, together with kidney transplants. And what they found was that I think one or two of those patients were able to come off insulin for short periods of time, and then they the transplants essentially failed over, over the course of time. So when I came to the program in 1997, 1998, when I'd finished all my training, they wanted someone to reinvigorate this islet cell transplant program. And I seemed to be the, the, the full guy. <laughs> and it, with 300 previous attempts and this long history in Edmonton, but, but lack of success, um, it really fell on me to say, well, maybe we should just give it one last kick at the can, one, one last attempt to see if we can get islet cell transplants to work. And I've been researching that in the lab and did a PhD in the, in looking at the anti-rejection drugs to see if we could get the better drugs that would be kinder on the islet cells when they were transplanted, let them work better. And so I made about eight or nine different changes to the existing protocols. And one of them was to use fresh cells prepared from an organ donor rather than leaving them in culture for a few days. Another was changing the anti-rejections of drugs around so that we avoided all um, steroids. So steroids are very bad. They cause diabetes and they were used typically in every transplant patient up till that point. But we came up with a process that would allow a transplant to work without the need for the, for these steroids. So there were many different changes uh, right. in, in the approach. And then the probably the big thing was to give the cells, uh, put them inside the vein, inside the liver without surgery. Uh, so it could be done in the x-ray department. And, and that process now has become very standardized. What do you mean? Uh, Explain that. Okay, so so there's a there's a vein that runs up um, towards the liver. It doesn't really matter what the name is. It's called the yeah. portal, portal vein, uh, and it has it's like a tree. There's lots of little branches in the liver. So an X-ray doctor, what's called an interventional radiologist, can look at the liver with an ultrasound initially, and then put needles in the liver through the side with local anaesthetic, and they can basically prong one of those little twigs of the tree. And once they get into the, into a twig, they can pass a guide wire down, a little fine metal wire and get, get into the main trunk. And then they over the wow. wire, they can then put a tube. So this doesn't require surgery. It takes about 20 minutes or so. They're very skilled at doing it. And there we have access to the liver to be able to infuse cells uh, into, into this vein. And that was the, the same vein that the um, that's, that uh, pathologist in St. Louis, uh, Paul Lacey, had, had discovered it was quite a good place to put islet cells. So the liver becomes the new home for the, the cells because the pancreas isn't functioning. Well, the, the liver becomes a new home mainly because it's the pancreas is a very soft jelly-like organ, very difficult to sew to, very difficult to hmm. implant cells back into it. Whereas the liver is, is actually a, a, a really 
good home for, for it. I mean, there are some other issues with it, but it just happens that the cells can nest there. They can form a new blood supply. They can engraft and they can make insulin and in, in perfect needs according to what the body needs. Now, I guess one of the issues here is if you're using live or live don- or donor cells that are, that are there that... Y- I mean, there's always going to be, there is today and there always will be a lack of donors. There's just not enough. Yeah. So, so that's exactly right. Patients die tragically on, on our waiting list for, for life-saving transplants yeah. every day. It's, it, it's terrible. And, and you, you mentioned at the beginning, the 450 million people across the world that have all forms of diabetes, we know there'll never be enough organ donors right. uh, to, to, to address that need. You know, there's, there's maybe 30,000 organ donors across the world every, every year so, as, a, as a guide. So there's never going to be enough organ donors. So while that process was, you know, positive, we had a great experience with it. The Edmonton protocol, the first seven patients that we treated, all of them were able to stop taking their insulin injections and had perfect or near perfect sugar control. So that was, that was really proof that a cell transplant could work. But they don't work over the long haul. Is that, that's the issue. So the challenges with the Edmonton protocol relying on the organ donors is first that they are just like any other organ transplant, they are foreign tissue. It's called an allograft. So they, they get rejected by the body. So you have to take powerful, very powerful anti-rejection drugs. If you don't take those drugs, the cells will get re- rejected. And also the autoimmune antibodies will come back and attack attack the cells. So that's that's the challenge. And, but with, with the right cocktail of drugs, we're able to keep transplants working. In fact, some of the very earliest patients, 21 years later, are still insulin free now. Uh, after their transplants, not many of them, but most go back to small or medium amounts of insulin. But the, what they avoid is the dangerous swings in the blood sugar because they now right. have a the thermostat back in the body instead of being down in the garden shed. So they might have to inject insulin, but sort of on occasion, and they would know that and their body would be telling them. I mean, if you're a diabetic, you live with this 24-7. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. You, you start to read the signs. Yeah, that's right. But if you've got if you've got a cell system in your body that's able to respond second to second, and these cells literally pulse out insulin every few minutes, right. whereas an injection of, in, of insulin happens, you know, before your meals. So you can never control things precisely that way. But if you provide some what's called auto regulation, big word, but basically your body is able to control things again, you can get much more precision in your blood sugar and avoid the dangerous lows and potentially avoid the highs too. So, so the Edmonton protocol was proof that this cell transplant type therapy could work, but it wasn't a cure because of the risks of the anti-rejection drugs and because we'd never have enough cells to treat everybody. And you've also got people that can come back time and again for that. They get a transplant of cells. It works for three or four years. Then they come back again. So that exactly works. Right. So that, 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 that's a, a, a sort of top up. So the yeah. cells are still working, but not quite enough. We, we put more cells in, more fresh cells in. And when we do that, that again, frees them from insulin for sustained periods of time. So you really need to be able to create masses of cells um, and and not be dependent on donors. So that process has to work uh, with the stem cell issue, which you take cells from other beings and you grow them and you create them and you create lots of them. So where are you at on that stage? Okay, so that so that that was years ago. So that seemed like a, a, a crazy dream. That that you know, how could you ever make <laughs> make these cells in the lab from stem cells? Well, people didn't really understand how how cells develop in in the body. Like we talked about the twenty seven days, but no yeah. one really knew, and we don't really even now fully understand all of that for sure. Uh, but. What was discovered was was um, it was actually a, a group in the United States called Viacite. What what they did was they took embryonic stem cells. So they took a, an embryo that was single embryo that was discarded from an IVF uh, clinic, in vitro fertilization right. clinic. It was an, a spare embryo, and the the family donated it to to science. And what they did is they took this one it was one tiny little blastocyst. It was you know five day old ball of cells, and they took some of the cells from one of the layers in there. And they expanded them up and then they added different growth factors to different days. And across um, this 27 days, they were able to coax these cells into being islet-like cells that made human insulin. And that happened about 20, 
years ago. In fact, just as we were releasing the results of the Edmonton Protocol, that that group approached me and said, well, hey, we've got these stem cells that could be of interest. Would you like to work with us and, and maybe test them one day? And I, I absolutely said, yeah, yeah, for sure, we'd <laughs> like to do that. Uh, and so we've been working with Viasite. We've carried out clinical trials now, a number of different clinical trials. Now, these are... Of course, just like an organ donor, they are what they call allogeneic. They're not the same cells as your own body, these right. ones, because they're taken from this one embryo and can be massively expanded up in, into basically a limitless supply of cells. Uh, and when we transplant those, we've been putting them under the skin inside a device, and we're able to get the cells to make some insulin, small amounts under the skin. It's not quite as good as the liver right now, but it, we can see signals that they're making cells and they're able to stabilize the blood sugar and we're able to measure the insulin now in, in the blood in small amounts. And so we've made a lot of progress, I think, with that over the last several years. And we're also excited about it because this group is working with another company called CRISPR Therapeutics and CRISPR is a, is a new form of technology that allows you to edit the genes inside the cell to make them so that those cells will not be rejected by the body. And we're hoping to start clinical trials with that kind of approach in the, in the next year or two, but that's embryonic stem cells. That was one of the other things. And I don't know whether it fits into the puzzle here that I read that was interesting, that there's kind of a miracle anti-aging um, compound of some kind, AAGD. I'm not sure if I've got the okay. initials right, but yeah. that if you kind of wrap the cells in that, then they have a longer life. I mean, I won't get into <laughs> where can I get some of this and I'd like <laughs> to have it myself. Just explain that. So so, so this anti-aging glycopeptide, AAGP, is a very cool molecule. In fact, <laughs> no it's kidding. Literally, <laughs> literally cool. Because it, it's, found, it's found in um, Arctic fish. It's, it's, it's basically antifreeze that stops fish, for, fish from <laughs> uh, freezing in, in, in the Arctic North. Uh, so th th uh, another company, uh, Proteokinetics, discovered this molecule. And we were given some to test in the islet cells. And, and we found by surprise that it actually did help the islet cells to survive. And, and another factor it did is it, it helped the cells uh, survive the anti-rejection drug side effects. So it was an important molecule for us to test. So we've, we kept, we're actually in the middle of a clinical trial right now, testing that in a number of patients to see if it will improve the survival of the cells and maybe look, make the patients younger at the same time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> maybe, this could be a, a two for one. I yeah. have to ask, and, and I want to carry on with this conversation, but every time, um, and I remember having this conversation in an earlier life with Stephen Jay Gould, trying to get inside the head of people like you and the scientists that develop this, your brain works differently than my brain to make those kinds of connections. What is it that that creates a person like James Shapiro? What, what process goes on? Is it just curiosity in the real life? In real life, did some doctor say one thing to you when you were young and it left an impression? Have you got a different kind of mind that translates information differently. What's your theory? Well, you better ask my wife because she thinks I'm <laughs> a little uh, cuckoo. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sure she does. I can see that, but it's extraordinary. Yeah, well, well, I, th I don't have the answer uh, to that. I know I, there's I, no I, answer. I, I just I, want I, you to think about I, it out loud. <laughs> I, 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 think I, I think very simply, and I, I'm very persistent. You know, as, as a child, I was, uh, I, I guess I always nagged my parents for this, that, and the other, and I, I never really let go of things. And maybe that's an example now, tenacity. You know, I kept, yeah. you know, I've been working on this thing for 35 years. I, I should have really stopped years ago when all my, experiment, all my experiments didn't work in Newcastle. I should have had <laughs> nothing to do with it any, anymore. But failure but, is a good teacher, right? <laughs> yeah, well, failure is a good teacher and, and yeah. not, being able, not being able to let go and thinking, yeah. well, if I just do this thing, maybe it'll work. If I just do this, maybe it'll work. And so that that's... That's how mine mine works. It's it's not clever. I'm I'm in terms of you know IQs and the rest of it. I'm probably the worst in the class. I wasn't you know maybe as attentive as I should be at school. My mind would wander. Um, so I you know it's it's not you know I'm, I'm trying to explain to you that it's there's 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 no yeah. brilliance here. It's it's just hard work, persistence, hard work, tenacity, not letting things go, and a belief that 
eventually something better is 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 out there and within reach and i mean when you think about the doctor in the 1800s to get, taking a sheep's pancreas and trying to insert bits and pieces of it like it's hard to imagine why in that time when medicine was so rudimentary that that would even come to his come to mind yeah well, absolutely i mean it was maybe a, a, around the time that people discovered that the pancreas had anything to do with diabetes so there, there's a there's a right. leap of you know there's a thought leap right there you know yeah okay, the pancreas is somehow linked with diabetes what if we try and shove a new one into a patient under the skin yeah. It's got to start somewhere, I guess, in terms of that process. All right. I know it's unfair to ask you questions like that, but I just I can't help it when I uh, when I get into these conversations with people whose brains work in a different way. All right. We'll try and come back. Maybe maybe I can just just uh, just to reflect on that a bit more. Yeah. Where where did this all come from for me? Like I I knew I wanted to be a, a surgeon. I it began as a child. And I, my father was a family uh, physician right. in, in, a, in, a, in a busy, uh, d- a d- in a inner city practice in, 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 in Leeds in England. I used to go with him to, to work on a, on a Saturday morning when he'd have his, he called them surgeries, but they would basically see patients in the office. Mm-hmm. And I'd sit there with him as a, it must've been five or six. And he'd stick a stethoscope around my neck. I'd sit on the swivel chair next to him. Right. I'd listen to the, to him and the patients. The patients sometimes would give me, you know, some money for some candy, 50, 50 pence or something. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would wander around his office, his surgery office there, and I'd look in the in the in the cupboards, in the um, in the glass showcases. There'd be syringes and needles and old ether masks and and, and curly tubing from anaesthetic equipment and vials. I was completely and utterly fascinated by this stuff. Completely and utterly. Like, and 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 when I was sixteen years old, um, I, I must have again driven my dad crazy because he. he um, <laughs> He said, he said to me, well, I've got a friend who's a surgeon. If you want, he, he said, he'll let you scrub in on some surgeries for one day. And I, I said, wow. Come yeah. on. Absolutely. That is absolutely <laughs> true. I remember the, the three surgeries vividly, you know, right now they, there was a, a breast surgery, a thyroid surgery and a, and a gallbladder. And, um, well, I, I scrubbed and in. And you were on, 16. 16. I was 16. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the, I've, well, you can imagine as a 16 year old, it, it, my eyeballs popped out of my head and I, right. and I knew then and there that surgery was going to be my thing. And, now, and, there was, and I know this and others may not, but you had a brief flirtation with the BBC that you might think about doing journalism or broadcasting. All I can say is, thank God you didn't. What was that all about? <laughs> what was that about? Again, it, a fascination, fascination with electronics and wires. I mean, as a young child, I used to twiddle wire. I'm twiddling a wire right now, but I used to twiddle, little, twiddle, twiddle wires and think about wires connecting to this and the other. And somehow I got a, a summer job working for a, a local radio station. I helped them set up with an outside broadcast. Um, and later on, I I, I had my own radio show in, in Northeast England where they connected 15 or 20 different hospitals together on hospital radio and then did interviews for the, for the BBC. I, I mean, I love that stuff. I used to edit tapes, you know, take the China graph pencil, yeah. and yeah. put marks on them, splice the tape, put them I together. I did that in radio in the early days as well. Yeah. And you stick yeah. it back together with tape. Nobody can even believe it in this. No, uh, I know. Well, now it's so simple, but I still love that stuff. I mean, you can't see here, but <laughs> got this in front of me and uh, the on. audience can't, but there's a big microphone there. So he yeah. really still is, yeah, um, a, uh, you know, a broadcaster yeah, just trying to break through that whole doctor front. Yeah. And I've got a mixing console here with, with green lights going up and down. And it's, <laughs> it still fascinates me even, even today. But anyway, that's on the side. Yeah. And, and not really that different from how the body works when you think about it. We're all this massive wires that communicating yeah. with each other. Exactly right. It's yeah. crazy. All right. Okay. I We'll get back to stem cells. So now we're talking about stem cells that come from a third party. Uh, let's put it that way, a donor or something that's created from embryonic uh, cells and wrapping them in this anti-aging process or using all these other things that go on. But still, 
that's foreign to the body and that remains the big test. So then where you're going now is using people's own cells inside this stem cell from themselves, not these third party uh, donors, so that the real rejection rates go down or perhaps even disappear. Yeah. So, so again, this was, it seemed like alchemy, like un- unbelievable science. You could, make, you could take a cell from the body and turn it into something else. Well, yeah. that sounds ridiculous. You know, who, who, whoever <laughs> could imagine that that could ever happen. Well, a, a scientist in, in, in Japan, uh, Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for this work, discovered that if he added four little chemicals to the, to the surface of any adult cell, he could unlock the the control systems inside that cell. So just to put it again, really, really simply for you, mm-hmm. um, inside our body, every cell has exactly the same copy of the entire body's DNA. The instructions how to make a body are, are in your skin cell, your nail cell, your heart cell, you know, your blood cell, everywhere. Everywhere that has a nucleus has has instructions how to make the entire process in the body. Okay, but, it is mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling. We got to just mind-boggling. Yeah, but, but in, what keeps what keeps the blood cells remaining blood cell? What keeps the skin cell the skin cell? Well, there are breaks on 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 that system to stop them turning into everything and just <laughs> keep skin cells, skin cells, eye cells, eye cells, etc. Um, <laughs> but here, what this what the scientists discovered was that if he added these four factors back, and they're called the Yamanaka factors, he could turn any adult cell into any cell you want. Back, back basically like it would be in an, in an embryo. And he did this in his first paper in 2007. And he, this, this really blew people's minds because he took a skin cell and he added these four factors. And there in the dish was a beating heart. You could, you could see cells beating, beating. They oh my God. As, a, as an adult skin cell. And then here they were beating heart in it, beating heart cells in, in a dish. So combining that process with this 27 day growth factor process that I told you about at the beginning with these, em- with these yeah. other set stem cells, connecting those two together has now made it possible to take an adult blood cell. So we can take a syringe full of blood from a patient with diabetes. Just then, out of your arm. Out of your Just, arm. Exactly yeah. right. Type one, type two diabetes. We can extract the cells from there that have the nu- nuclear on it, like, like the white cells. We can then unlock them with these Yamanaka factors. And then we can follow them through this 27 day growth factor protocol and turn them into islet cells. And again, this seemed to me crazy. Never, this is never going to happen. <laughs> but actually it does. The, these, these processes are, are, are published by, by others. We didn't develop them. We've copied them. And we, they work really well in our hands. So we can take a, a mouse. We can make it diabetic. We can take blood from a patient with diabetes. We can turn the blood cells through this process into islet cells. We can transplant those islet cells back into the mouse. And the mouse is basically cured of diabetes, has a normal blood sugar. And it's making the patient's own insulin the cells are completely compatible with with the body so there's no reason to think that they would get rejected so the idea here is that we could do transplants without any anti-rejection drugs and if we could do that and we had a limitless supply of cells those are the two remaining barriers that change this from being a difficult treatment into one that could potentially be a cure i mean that changes the world yeah. Because it's not just this. I mean, then that protocol, then that understanding is transferred everywhere. I mean, you're using stem cells for fixing the heart or fixing blindness or whatever it might be. And that, that's that's happening right now. So those 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 what you're mentioning. So there are trials in Japan using these exact same. Um, IPS cells, they're called, inducible pluripotent stem cells. Patients, adult cells, they're putting them in the eye. There's, there's clinical trials that are happening with that. There's other trials wow. that are happening with, with, with heart cells. So ex- exactly right. But our, our focus, of course, right now is on diabetes. It's so hard in this world. I mean, we watched what happened in response to COVID. Um, Give President Trump his due. He set up Operation Warp Speed and miraculously companies developed a a vaccine in six months instead of six years. And we may be be actually able to manage this, uh, this pandemic and this disease in an ongoing way. And then you come to all this research that's going on quietly and behind closed doors and costing the system, as we said at the beginning, trillions uh, 
of dollars. And it seems like it would just be a smart investment if governments actually put some money. I mean, of course, private donors doing all of that into saying, look, if you solve this one, it's going to save us literally trillions of dollars in the foreseeable future. But they don't. Well, uh, <laughs> governments, uh, you know, w- would like a guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and w- what I've got is, you know, a, a great idea and some <laughs> signal of proof. Yeah. But not enough yet to say, okay, here we go. Here's this. This is ready for 450 million people with diabetes across the world. Yeah. We're trying to get there now by by taking this step by step into first in human trials. I'm hoping to start first trials within a year from now. Okay. Putting patients' own cells back in and under the skin inside devices so that we can do this safely and show that the cells do what they're supposed to do. And at the same time, we're working with some really brilliant experts in areas of science that I know nothing about, which is, is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and these really smart robots that can mass manufacture. So we're working with a company called Lonza that has a, a room full of these, what they call cocoons. And they, the idea, the concept is that you'd have a, an orchard, they call it the orchard, growing cells so that you could basically harvest whatever cells you need at mass production to deliver on a per patient basis, personalized medicine. And that is going to happen. You know, people are put put off by this right now and think, well, no, this is going to be way too expensive to make personalized own cells. Well, Today, that might be true, but I think we have yeah. to look beyond the horizon. You know, I think back to when the first, very first cell phones came out and my uncle had one and he had, it was the size <laughs> of a, a great big briefcase. I mean, it literally yeah. was a briefcase. Uh, and now, we've, you know, you and I have got one in our, in our pockets. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the advances are going to happen. And if we, the, you know, necessities of mother invention, but we, we can drive that process forward by looking beyond the immediate and, and trying to get to the medium and long term. I saw some pictures of those labs with the cocoons. I mean, it's kind of sci-fi spooky stuff, but it, I mean, it seems natural. You got to grow them somewhere. I mean, you're not going to do it in the basement. No, so it, it's going to happen for, for certain. It's going to happen. So, um, the, the funding issue, I know, and one of the when when I called you initially, it was something that I'd heard on the radio, uh, this idea that for 2022, which is to get us through like the next two years, this being the anniversary of banding and best and whatnot. If people just donated 22 bucks and you had one million people do that in Canada, which isn't a big number. But the end result is that's 22 million bucks. If if five million people did it, like it is a simple way for people to kind of make a contribution, not just families with diabetes, uh, uh, pe- you know, family members and issues. And and I, I'm I'm one of those. But everybody should sort of see this science because if you solve it here, you're going to solve it for other diseases that are going on and that are impacting us too. It's a pretty simple request. It is, but uh, touching the heart and and, and reaching out to a million Canadians is not easy. Yeah. Uh, With this group that's helping us with with that heading to 2022.com is is a phenomenal group of grassroots individuals that are passionate about finding something better for diabetes. And some of them have are touched by diabetes themselves. Others just right. want something better for humanity and want it, want this discovery and, and advances to, uh, to be in Canada. You know, we've, we've hundred years ago, we had the success of Banting and Best. We want the Canadian uh, work in, in diabetes to, to, to continue. So yeah, we, we need that to happen because connecting the dots between where we are yeah. right now in mice to treating the first 12 or so patients does require equipment, resources, growth factors, technicians, you know, and it can't be done on, on, on fumes. So yeah. we're, we're writing some huge grants right now. We're looking, <laughs> turning over every stone that we possibly can to, to get funding to, to do this. We're making a little bit of progress, but it's uh, slow, slow going. Um, yes, we'd like governments to, to, to invest and recognize the long-term future of diabetes. It's possible to have something better, but uh, you know, they're going to need proof and, 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 and right. companies eventually the industry will take over this process for sure industry yeah. will take over this process once it's been proven and, and and established to work. But just to be clear, I mean, you are curing diabetes in mice and rats. 
Yes. It, like the, the technique is proven. It's proven, but I think that the, there's always going to be questions around, is this safe enough to, to do in patients? Is it safe enough to do in children? Do we know that the cells are going to remain the mm -hmm. way you've made them? Are they going to be stable over time? That's why research is needed. That's why we have to do trials step by step and, and demonstrate that it's safe and alter the process iteratively as we go along so that we can have a much brighter future. It's it's in a funny way, maybe the whole discussion around COVID is actually going to help because people are a bit of a wing and a prayer on the vaccine, too. It's I mean, these trials are way faster than anything that's generally allowed. But people are looking at it and saying, OK, it's worth it. We've got we've got to take that risk. And presumably that's what is at the core of all of this science and progress is you've got to risk something to gain something. I think that's exactly right. And and patients write to me every single day asking, how can I get on the list? How can I right. access your new stem cell therapy? And we're keeping it, we're keeping a database of those patients right now so that we can approach them uh, as we as we as we move forward. And I, I have to reflect back on, you know, eight eight or nine years ago when we began our first trials with these embryonic stem cells and we were putting them into patients. All of those first patients I sat down with and, and looked them in the eye and said, you know, this is a treatment potentially for the future. Right now we're testing it. We're, we can't guarantee at all that it's going to help you, but it's going to help mankind. And it's amazing how many patients come forward and are willing to participate under those parameters. Yeah, I think the companies are finding that with the vaccine. I mean, mm -hmm. Volker Gerritz in Saskatoon says he's got people lining up to test vaccines because they, they want to make that contribution. What about the, the existing islet um, surgery, uh, transplant surgery? Is that available? I mean, is that a really short list? How do people go about the, if they the, think they're a good candidate? Yeah, so, so the, the, the Edmonton protocol is, is a relatively short list, actually. There's, a, there's only about 15, 20 people on the, on the active list at any, any one time. We've had challenges with, with how we handle that across the country because it's approved in Alberta, it's funded in Alberta, right. but not necessarily funded in, in all other provinces. And that has created challenges for us and for patients because we've got several patients sort of listed, we call it state of zero in other provinces where we can't activate them fully because they don't, they haven't agreed to all the interprovincial uh, uh, funding. Right. So that still remains a bit of a challenge. <laughs> the joys of living in Canada, I don't know how many issues we come to that conclusion. Mm. It is a problem of jurisdiction, the federal, mm. provincial, all of that. Well, the work is, uh, is truly amazing and I so appreciate your time. You, you should be off in the lab doing this, but I'm really glad you, uh, you took some time to talk with us today. It's just great. Well, I've got a lab meeting coming up in, in, in 10 minutes. I'm excited. All right. Okay. <laughs> we'll let you go. And I'm going to explain to people here in a minute that they can find DriftCan on, uh, on the website there. So thank you, Dr. James Shapiro. I'm so glad you gave up on the BBC and came to Canada and that you're in beautiful downtown Edmonton. It's great. Thank you, Senator Wallen. Pa Pamela, thank you so much. Really <laughs> Thanks for your time. Today. All right. We'll talk again, I'm sure. So, Dr. James Shapiro on this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen, and you should. I think it's pretty simple. There's an organization called DRIFCAN, that's D R I F, a Diabetic Research Institute Foundation, and then CAN Canada. And you can find all the information you need there and how to donate. And I think it's as simple as 2022.com you can check on as well. So um, let's do this. Let's do this in Canada. It's just, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful story getting inside the minds of these guys who, who make change, make real change and save lives. That's it. We'll see you again soon for another edition of No Nonsense.